Hello, everyone. Welcome. We may give it just another minute or two for people to come on. Um, one of the suggestions that we would have is that um, for our breakout groups in the at the end of the session, we'd like you to rename yourself um, by your racialized identity, right? Because we're going to have affinity group conversations at the end. And so if you, um, so hopefully you know how to do that. You click on your picture, the three dots, and then you go to rename. And then what we're doing is we're going to be breaking out into black, non-black people of color and white um, for those groups. So if you can just rename yourselves with that, that would be helpful. We're going to do breakout groups at the end. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, in terms of the, the view, you may want to put it on hide um, non-video participants if you want to just see the panelists, um, but that's really up to you in terms of how you want to visualize it. All right, it's 10.35. Well, welcome everyone again. I'm Don Fong Kuhn and I'm the faculty co-director of the Transformative School Leadership Program and a professor at the University of San Francisco. Welcome to the second session of the See Her Summer series on humanizing education in the fight for Black lives, sharing lessons from the field. The Center for Humanizing Education and Research is a newly formed center at the University of San Francisco School of Education. The center was formed to address several troubling realities about academia. One, much of research is extractive and done to communities rather than with. Two, much of research is inaccessible to those who are in the best position to make change or to those most impacted. And three, critique is important to reading the world. And at this moment, everything that we see around us demonstrates that we also desperately need the collaborative muscles for building a new world now as we dismantle old oppressive institutions. In the spirit, faculty at USF birthed the center that promotes the generation, application, and diffusion of high quality research that is conducted in solidarity with communities to address pressing issues through humanizing frameworks. The center strives to increase institution and collective capacity to impact public consciousness, policy, and practice, and to contribute to stronger movements toward justice. And finally, the center provides a space to engage in the critical reflection necessary for transformative action and imagining something new. Today, we welcome you to one step along the way of realizing our collective humanization as we learn from a panel of phenomenal practitioners in the Bay Area. Moderating is Cecilia Jordan. Cece is a former teacher, restorative justice coordinator, and spoken word artist. She currently supports the organizational development of community-led organizations and contributes to research and scholarship on the transformation of schools and society. If you know her, you know that she elevates every space and lovingly brings us down to earth to do the work. Passing it on to Cece. Yay, good morning. Um, super excited to be here for y'all with y'all this morning. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. We are trying this hybrid model um, where we can do a breakout sessions afterwards, by, but also not doing the formal Zoom panel. So if for this moment, um, if you are not a conversation sewer, if you can turn off your video, just because, and I'm going to give you all a little trick. Um, so if you turn off your video and then on the right corner of anybody's name, you can click uh, on their name and say, hide non-video participants. And what that allows you to do is anyone who um, is only showcase our conversation sewers on this first page. So again, if you are um, if you are here participating with us, if you could turn off your video for this piece, and then we're gonna have you turn it back on afterwards for our affinity groups. And then last little housekeeping item, if next to your name, um, you see mine says Cecilia Jordan Black, if you could put, um, and you should be able to rename on the three dots on the top top, um, rename yourself to, with that racialized affinity group so that afterwards we can have a really dope conversation um, and make sure that it's a generative space for everyone. So yeah, I 
think that's everything. Your bathrooms are in your home. Um, we are not in public. So I think that's all the housekeeping items. But so next piece, if you could, in the little chat box below as well, um, while we won't have time for to answer more formalized questions, we will use those questions to inform the facilitator's guide that we're gonna put out for folks afterwards. And we're hoping that this facilitator guide gives you the opportunity to ha take these conversations to your campuses and actually begin to do this work. And so um, if any questions you have, drop them in and they will be noted, um, even if they're not answered in this particular moment. And the second thing is, just to wait i'm gonna say that getting ahead of myself um but i'm gonna introduce these awesome panelists i'm super super excited um, i'm gonna start off with the young person uh first jaira i was lucky enough to teach her five years ago when she was a seventh grader it is wild to me that she is now a senior in high school and i can truly say jaira is one of the first people i met when i moved to the bay from texas and she didn't just like push me to be a better teacher she pushed me to be a better human. And she was the one, um, she is the reason that I am like a poet out there like that. She was like, miss, you always tell us to follow our dreams and you don't follow yours. And so that was like the first poetry competition I ever did during the school year was because Jaira was like, yo, you gotta stop sleeping on yourself. And so I'm super excited. Um, she is a super senior at Ruth Asawa School of the Arts in San Francisco. Born and raised in Bayview Hunters Point, she believes in every hood is a land full of roses buried under concrete. As a community organizer and activist, she creates events to do what she calls put people on game and bring cultural awareness around the impacts of systemic injustices in terms of violence and mental health issues within our neighborhoods. A daughter, a sister, an auntie, and a homie, Jaira hopes to use her words as a poet to more fully understand the human condition and the fight for collective liberation not just for herself, but for all of our people. If we give some snaps for Jaira, uh, yeah. Or, um, next, Igosa Hamilton is a first generation Nigerian, originally from SAC, but she's currently uh, coming, zooming in for, with us today from Oakland. She has a master's degree in education and is currently a doctoral student in the international, in the international and multicultural education program at the University of San Francisco. She is moving towards her 13th year of teaching with a focus on social justice and anti-bias curriculum. Her research is centered on the experience of black girl learners and the cultural and ideological disconnects of educators in predominantly white secondary institutions. As a social justice educator, she seeks to give voice and visibility to those who've been left in the margin, margins. Creating Making Us Matter was a necessary step in acting towards combating anti-Blackness in schools and decolonizing curriculum through counter narratives. Uh, Gertrude Jenkins, oh, let's give it up. Let's give it for Igosa. Thank you for coming at us today. Uh, Gertrude Jenkins is a 13 year educator as well specializing in grades nine through 12 language arts. Over the course of her career, she's taught in Orlando, Florida, Atlanta, Georgia, and Redwood City, California. Jenkins is currently pursuing a doctorate at the University of San Francisco as a part of the IME program as well in the School of Education. Her research just focuses on anti-Blackness in K through 12 school systems in the US and abroad. As an educator activist, Jenkins has grown tired of constantly having to fight against covert and overt acts of racism in schools. Her motivation for creating Making Us Matter is steeped in her desire to provide an option and a safe space for families and Black educators alike, who prefer an educational institution that decenters whiteness and places Black gays at the forefront. Yeah, let's give it up for Gertrude. Thank you for coming in at us today. Um, Ebony is elated to be a black woman descended from continental Africans, grands, great grands, sharecroppers from the deep US South, whose life is exponentially illuminated by her role as a daughter, sister, auntie, friend, comrade, mentor, social worker, teacher. She is a Bay Area native currently residing in Oakland, working as a forensic social worker with youth and families involved in the juvenile injustice system. She also teaches disability critical race studies to new teacher and is a lifelong mentor for young black women and girls. It is with all these and other parts of herself that she traveled to Cuba to participate in the black socialist strategies for holistic healing and healthcare delegation to deepen her understanding of internationalism as modeled by Cuba and thus broaden her approach to the work she does and the life she lives. 
Yeah, thank you so much for being here today, Ebony. Um, Sierra Javay Gordon, uh, my homie, my sister, my poet teammate, is the Media Arts and Culture Program Manager uh, with, with RISE. CC mentors and supports her team as they collectively elevate all forms within RISE. CC is passionate about creating spaces where youth are comfortable so they can challenge themselves and their peers in the art in their art while com building community. CC has worked at the African American Resource and Cultural Center at UC Santa Cruz for four years, coordinating study jams and the Black graduation. She has taught poetry at the Santa Cruz County Jail. CC has a BA in soci sociology, has received the Dean's Award for her chapbook Incarcerated Words, all campus honors and placed fifth in the nation as part of the Roots Slam team. She has been on four national slam teams and currently serves as one of Richmond's Poets Laureate. And if I remember, this, this bio is out of date and you also have an MFA as well, CC. Right, so let's give it up for CC. Thank you. Uh, honored to be around so much brilliance today. Um, and this last person, uh, Wang Pham, uh, I'm super excited to be here, here with him as well. Taught elementary school in South LA for six years and continues to consult with the Center for Culturally Responsive Teaching and Learning. He is currently pursuing his law degree at the University of California, Davis, where he has also worked at the National Center for Youth and Public Advocates. Wang conducts research for the California School Discipline Project, focusing on specific students, namely Black, uh, native and youth engaged and alternative tribal based economies are still dispensable even when schools are moving away from punitive discipline policy. He holds a BS from the University of Oregon in political science and ethics studies and an MA in urban education for Loyola Marymount University. The rest of his waking hours are spent raising his new newborn daughter with his wife Brooklyn. All right, thank you so much. Give it up for Wang. Thank y'all. Um, so I'm just gonna start the conversation off. I had like some questions based on our pre-conversation, um, but I'm gonna to start it off with, with Jaira. Um, and, and again, y'all, a reminder, if you have any questions during this, pop them into the chat box and we will get to them in our facilitator's guide. And, and thank y'all so much for your participation today. Uh, so Jaira, um, as a black student who has been in a number of different schools in the city, what do you think educators need to know and address in order, uh, in an effort to interrupt anti-Blackness in education? Um, well, first, like walking into a classroom as a Black student, I feel like educators need to see Black students as human first. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm a person too. Um, and I feel like if, if an educator doesn't look like you, then in a way they can't relate to your experience or they don't try to. It's like you have to go the extra mile. Um, and also like just expectations, you know, like you can't hold the bar too high. You know what I'm saying? Because I may not be there yet because I come from schools where we had lack of opportunity and resources. But at the same time, like you can't, you can't be like, oh, you're stupid or you know what I'm saying? Or not, or treat me as less than, um, because then we get defensive um, as black students. So I think like seeing us as human first and understanding our background culturally and the opportunities that we have and haven't had so we can perform in the classroom as well as we can. Thank you for sharing that, Jair. Um, and is there anything like particularly that in terms of in this moment, um, in this particular moment, that you wish teachers would shift to talking about more? Like what is something that you have not learned in school that you're like, it is evident we need to learn this this year, period? Um, well, okay, so because I go to the School of the Arts, I particularly, I particularly chose uh, art high school because I wanted my art incorporated in my education because like through my art is how like I live you know like I wouldn't I tell people all the time I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for poetry um so I just think that art like in ways to handle and cope with our trauma like we need to learn about that in schools you know or even like Miss J taught me about like Emmett Till when I was like in the seventh grade like their students like my age that's black that don't even know about Emmett Till or like what actually happened just like black history is just like Martin Luther King like that's not true like there's so much 
more and I think we don't see ourselves represented in history and in classes and like that's another big issue yeah, word yeah I feel like that's a perfect connection to Egosa and Gertrude would y'all mind sharing just a little bit um yeah I'm like I have so many questions for y'all well let me let me start with Egosa so in terms of like what what Jaira is saying, because um, I imagine that she's one demographically, she's been in a lot of spaces where, especially with the waves of gentrification, the black populations are shrinking in schools. So how do you create black places for black students in a majority white context? And yeah. Yeah, I think um, the first thing that comes to mind is acknowledging that I have dogs, I apologize, um, is acknowledging that black students come into school feeling defensive off top, right? You have to defend yourself from your white teachers who may be coming at you with microaggressions from your classmates. So when you come into a space being defensive off top, you don't have the freedom to be creative, to fully learn to process in the way that we, we would want our students to do. And so as teachers, we need to acknowledge that black students are coming in protecting themselves from all the stuff that comes with being in a school, especially a school that is predominantly white um, because uh, traditional schools are really centered on elevating and amplifying white authors, white history, white everything. And so as educators being conscious of that and making sure we are um, creating visibility for those students to kind of break down those defensive walls that they've learned to build up as a means of surviving school, but also surviving America. Um, and so that's the first thing. And I think with Gertrude and I and Make It As Matter, it was really about how do we create a space where they can just come exist and then learn. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's that. And then, so like, and I feel like you go like, from Jaira to Ego, so you go to like, okay, if you do this, um, this will work. And then I feel like Gertrude's piece of the story is, now if you do all of the right things and you are a highly qualified teachers in all of the ways that the system says, and you have the best reading scores and you, abol you, know, and you, you work to abolish anti-blackness, um, then what have you seen happen in those situations, Gertrude? You get met with a fight <laughs> um, and, and, and that's been, the experience, um, I encourage teachers to continue to fight no matter what, but um, when you do all those things and you put those things, uh, when, when you decenter whiteness and you bring in curriculum that is representative of the experience of students in your room, um, that's, there's a lot of truth telling in that. And quite honestly, we have a school system that prefers that we don't share those truths with our students. Um, because having those truths makes you an informed citizen. And as we can see, the last thing you want in this country appears to be an informed citizen. So we are just like producing that over and over again. So I think um, for teachers who choose to step away from that and include a, or just center their pedagogy in actually seeing the students in front of them, um, there's a lot of power in that. Um, there's a lot of bravery in that because you're often met with um, adversity, but um, I think it's worth it. And I think that, you know, especially what Jair is saying, it's very important for black educators to make it very clear to their students, that, especially their black students, that this experience you're having at the student level, I'm having this experience at the teacher level um, and, and make that very clear. It's very easy to get caught up in like, I am, am, am part of this, you know, administrative force in this school and it distances yourself from the student, despite the fact that you didn't have very similar experiences. So um, to all teachers that are doing that, I just I keep on. And, and, and if you've been afraid to, don't be. <laughs> or, um. And in terms of like for other, I, I don't even like using the word ally in this moment because Afro-pessimism, some of the thoughts that Kiana, if y'all were in the last talk, Kiana, uh, uh, Dr. Ross and Dr. Shange were talking about in Afro-pessimism, one of the talk, things they talk about in terms of anti-Blackness is we don't necessarily need out, in, uh, allies, we need folks who are also enemies of white supremacy beside us. So in terms of that, when you think about that, 
how have or how could have other folks shown up for you or did they show up for you or like what if if, if you could reimagine that moment and take that back what would that have looked like um the moment that stands out for me the most is uh, something that happened in atlanta when i taught when um i was suspended for sitting in a black lives matter protest with students and um in that moment, like the whole the whole ordeal was not comfortable, it, it, it hurt, but what hurt the most was coming back after that suspension and no one said anything, like not a single teacher on the team. Um, it, it, it was a complete erasing of what happened and it was an erasing in front of students, you know? So I think about it as like using me as this cautionary tale to other black students, especially black girls, like this is what happens when you step out of line and that's how you get dealt with. And, and, and it's when I knew, it was the point when I knew I had to get up out of there, but that's what hurts the most, the silence of your coworkers. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it, that, that has been, so, so reimagining those moments, definitely what I would have loved to see is, you know, a phone call or when I get back, you know, how, how dope would it have been like, yo, look, that, that was messed up. Um, this is what we're doing. This is how we're going to help you, you know, get through the rest of the year. Cause I wasn't going to leave my kids no matter how mad I was, but, um, just those moments of acknowledgement and, and some muscle behind it. There was another incident, an example of like what to do at my current school. Um, there was an incident where I got called the N word by, by a student. And in that situation, um, my principal, like, would, like let me unload. I felt, I felt comfortable to unload what happened and how I felt. And it turned into a school-wide thing where there was awareness, where we're going to talk about this issue, we're not going to move away from it. So, like, it, it, it's a very sharp contrast, um, but, but, but that, that being seen and, and acknowledged, just as important it is for students, is important for us as well. Yeah, yeah. And what I feel like what I hear you saying is, like, when we do anti-Blackness and there are other folks committed to that work, it's about recognizing the interpersonal violences and then connecting to inter institutional interventions. What are processes, policies, and practices that can actually shift this? Because a lot of the times what we do, we see is we see the system leans on the organic intellectualism of black folks and indigenous folks and people of color within the system without actually shifting structural pieces. And that actually reifies the racism because not only are you tokenizing this person of color, um, but you are putting them within a system in which they will inevitably crash because they are constantly budding through that like concrete that Jair was talking through. And it's like, you bud through the concrete a little bit, but it's like, no, y'all need to actually do something to get the concrete out. <laughs> um, and so in terms of that, I feel like that organically takes me to like Ebony um, as like a teach, being on a teacher and also the therapist side, I really like this story you shared of like, how is it that you were able to create processes and policies rooted in um, protecting black students? Um, that's a beautiful question, thank you. I um, taught for nine years um, and I started teaching in Richmond. Um, and when I was at the very first school I was at, I felt like there was a, um, there was space to be human as folks have talked about for the children and all, as well as for the adults. And so I felt like I was able to <clears throat> really um, very organically connect my practice as a teacher to who I am as a human being. So then when I transferred over to um, Richmond High School uh, for the next four years, that environment was very different. <clears throat> and so um, as uh, Gertrude was, was speaking about um, the kind of isolation and disrespect that uh, black students were experiencing. I was as well with a staff that was predominantly white an administration that was predominantly white. Um, and so what I saw very clearly and was even told by some of the staff there was, you know, that there was an aggressive attempt to get rid of black students rapidly. Richmond High School was like just dropping black students each year. Um, and so, and I was listening to the students and watching, like I was, I'm a special ed teacher. I was a special ed teacher. So I was um, in classrooms watching, you know, students be disrespected and assaulted, you know, 
openly and also, you know, um, not openly, directly and indirectly. And so what we did was, um, I, I'm always about trying to create space that feels safe for Black students, specifically Black girls, wherever I am. And so we had a Black girls group. And one of the things that we talked about a lot that they needed to vent about and complain about was feeling like the teachers didn't like them, feeling like the teachers were being racist. And so one, it was a, it was a space where they could do that. And, they, and, and I wasn't sort of taking up that position, which I saw a lot of my colleagues, the colleagues of color, sometimes taking this position of like, okay, well, you're just kind of using that as an excuse to not do your work or yeah, that's it, but you gotta just move past it. It was like, no, that's not right. You know, I know, I know, I feel it too. So they were validated in speaking their experience um, and they were validating each other too. It wasn't like they were just sort of like complaining in their little, you know, groups of friends, they were together. And so I think that was, that was one thing that was very key. And then from there, we were able to move into a space of like, okay, well, this isn't right. And like, what are we going to do about it? And so we created, you know, with the students, we created a system where they, um, when they were feeling assaulted in their classrooms, it was, you know, we, they had little notebooks, write down the date, write down what it was, come to me. <clears throat> and there were some other folks that were working with us, go to them. We talk about it. And then we created a system where I would then follow up with the teacher or the staff, whoever it was, hear their perspective. And then we folded in a rest we had restorative justice at the school. So we would fold in the restorative justice, um, facilitator to facilitate a conversation so that accountability could be held. I mean, cause our students need to be held accountable. You know, I definitely believe that all students particularly black students who I'm, you know, invested in need to hold a standard of excellence, hold a standard of integrity. And so, yeah, you can't be acting a fool in class. Um, but you also, you're, if you're not, I'm not going to allow you to be disrespected. And so these teachers need to be checked. These administrators need to be checked. And so um, it was great. Like the students felt like they, um, you know, they had somebody to have their back. And they, and they also, I think it took away some of the, you know, because sometimes, you know, like, like uh, I think uh, Igosa was saying, they go in defended. So there were definitely particular teachers, particular classrooms where students would go in already. They like acting a fool as a defense to not be disrespected, to not be assaulted. And so I think it took some of the need to sort of, they knew someone had their back and they knew that there was um, a place where they could handle it, you know? So it was sort of channeling that energy in a direction that addressed it. And we looped in the parents and parents felt good. Like I, I remember parents being like, I don't even go to the school because, you know, you know, they, they're rude. You know, they don't, they clearly don't want us there. It was a very, like racially tense place for black parents on that campus and once this kind of got started it felt like parents felt like they had more of a voice they felt like they had you know people to support them on campus support their children and and it was a beautiful thing yo that's so dope and what i really like and i think what i hear you saying and i don't know if this is your mental health perspective as a therapist as well but um we're actually giving like coping skills um, for institutionalized racism when we create protocols and processes. And I think the other thing I heard you saying, um, because we're gonna like talk about it in the affinity groups is like the role of anti-blackness and internalized anti-blackness, right? Is I think a lot of black teachers and other people of color, and I remember, and the reason I asked Jair to join this panel is because I remember doing this and feeling horrible is <clears throat> Jair get into it with the teacher and I'm like yo yes and like you gotta do better you gotta be better like forget these teachers and I think it's actually really oppressive to our black youth when we as black folks kind of do this kind of Greek culture thing where we're like I went through it you gotta do it too this hazing culture and I'm like no because that stuff comes from slavery like we can't keep operating in plantation politics of I'm gonna beat you so the white man doesn't beat you even harder. No, no, like at some point, and I think this is the generation and the time we have to say, I hear you, baby, yes. And these are the things that I can do as an adult to institutionalize these things and also make sure that you're not 
consistently institutionally gaslit. Because I think what I hear you talking about, I'm like, these institutions gaslight us. They gaslight our young people. They uh, tear up our logic. And so, and, and what is, uh, Cece as my poetry teammate, what is so beautiful is she um, has experienced such difficult things and I've always appreciated her as a poet because she has the re ability to bring it back to the body, back to the self, back to the like, how am I processing the pain of, of the death around me? Um, and so like what I wanted to ask you, Cece, is like how, um, like how do you create those spaces for our youth when we are in a state of constant grief? Absolutely. Um such a necessary question. I think even now I'm holding a lot of grief and pain. Um, we had a young person last week from Richmond, and y'all may have heard of her, Zari, um, who passed away in Sacramento. She was murdered um, at a cemetery, nonetheless. And so, yes, always having to kind of navigate how we're able to show up in different spaces, especially when we're talking about our school systems, we're talking about being in spaces that are predominantly white um, or spaces that are just not used to um, or understand the context of our pain and our grief. And oftentimes that we're not actually able to process one death, right? Because things are happening back to back to back. Um, and I think in addition to that, we're not even talking about have young folks eaten today. We're not talking about have young folks gotten what they needed at home because, you know, mom or dad or whoever is working multiple jobs, whatever the case may be. We're not talking about do you have support in terms of getting your work done, all of these things. Do you have emotional support? Oftentimes we have school systems that have maybe one, maybe two counselors, right, um, who are holding space for hundreds of students. Um, and so for me, it's a little bit different because I work at a youth center. So I work at Rise Youth Center in Richmond. Um, so we don't have the same constraints as in a larger institution. Um, but what that looks like is, is you actually have to normalize healing. And what I mean by that is we can't have healing circles every time somebody dies, right? Young people, they, we as humans and as adults, we don't work like that. I can't grieve and process every single time because yeah, it's happening, you know, sporadically and happening um, at random times. And so for us, it's like, this is now something that's implemented into our curriculum. I teach um, spoken word and competitive poetry. That means that every single week, young folks already have an expectation that we're gonna do libations. We're gonna make space to talk about our ancestors, um, to talk about the folks who you know, meant something to us and we, we choose to carry those people throughout our work, right? That actually um, holds space in how we utilize poetry, right? Um, this idea, around like poetry saving young people um, and, and us as adults is such a real concept, right? But you actually have to keep healing as a central aspect of that because poetry can easily become, especially in competition, right? It can easily become this like pimping for poetry. Like I just want you to get on stage and talk about the most traumatic experiences of your life, get some tins, and then we finna go out to eat. Right, and now that young person is literally just poured everything and is not being refilled in any way. Um, and so I think just answering that question, a lot of it is what can we make the new normal, essentially. So outside of healing circles, how are you just holding space to talk? Have these girls groups, right? Have groups for our young men, have groups for our gender non-conforming folks. Like how are we actually creating more spaces that this is just in the curriculum, this is a part of it. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention, just listening to folks, is really uplifting the importance of language, right? And I feel like there's so much that isn't taught around language. Like I was just talking to some of my young people about, you know, when people say um, colored folks, right? Like, oh, I'm, well, I'm just a colored person, you know, and them not being taught anything about Jim Crow, you know what I'm saying? And like, for me, it's an immediate visceral response of like, no, don't say that word, you know? But for them, it's like, no, this is what my teacher said in class. This is what I was called. And I didn't think of it as a negative term because this is my teacher. I'm not thinking of it in that way. And so I think how do we really start to 
delve deeper into having conversations around what we call ourselves, what we've been called, how those things are connected to our healing practices, right? And then how those things are connected to our deep traumas that we're experiencing throughout these school systems. And I, the last thing I wanna say is like, I know that there are a lot of white educators, right? And so thinking about like, what is your work around naming anti-Blackness in your spaces, right, as a teacher. But more importantly for me, I need you to name it for yourself, right? Because you actually grew up in families and structures and systems and all of these things that have taught you that you are the apple of the, of the world, right? Like you are the greatest of the great, right? And we understand white supremacy is a thing, we're dealing with it, but at the same time, we have white educators who are, you know, who do good work, but because they're not willing to say like, oh, this might be anti-Black of me, um, or my mama said this, or my, my grandfather said this, because we're not willing to have those conversations, young folks are still feeling like we can't, we're not going to be able to fully connect because you don't want to admit that you're actually rooted in these practices. You're rooted in my oppression and you're teaching me. Do you understand how that's like a complicated thing? I can't learn from you if I feel like you're rooted in my oppression. What are you gonna teach me? Um, that was a lot, but yes, <laughs> all of those things, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and coming from the South, CC, you, it really makes me think about my grandparents who did not go to integrated schools. Um, and when I moved out here, I was teaching at a continuation school in West Oakland and I remember I was doing uh, 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 from t facing history, facing ourselves. I have a reconstruction unit that's super dope. And uh, I showed a picture of a plantation and a young person was like, wait, that's for real, for real? It like for real exist? And I was like, yeah, fam, like plantations were for real, for real. And when I would teach them about enslavement, they were just like, well, you know, like, I didn't know it was for real, for real, for real. And I'm like, yeah, it's for real, for real, fam. Um, and, and what it makes me think about is when I met Wang, um, he, we, he was in a room at a KIPP conference and the only person talking about culturally responsive pedagogy, which was why the room was like standing room only. And he really opened to my eyes, like what I could teach as a teacher at an elementary school and, and how to lean into the discomfort of teaching about these very quote unquote adult concepts. But when you're at schools, when two thirds of your youth are undocumented and everyone's impacted by incarceration, like those adult things, I like, I think what we're not saying is like, those, those that might be adult things for folks with privilege, for us, they're everyday life, right? And so for me, what was so different, I see this video and it's like a six or seven year old that and Wayne, and they're talking about oppression. And Wang taught me that, you know, you can teach kids about the pilgrims and the Wampanoags. You can teach about gentrification. You can teach about this and you can teach about it in the first grade. You can teach about skin color and melanin and, and, and all of those adult things that we think are an adult. It's actually utmost, uh, of utmost importance that we start super, super young. So Wang, like what made you to decide to teach, uh, yeah, six-year-olds about oppression? Yeah, um, I just want to take a moment and say that this this has been the most powerful conversation that I've heard um, in a long, 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 long time. I, you know, I appreciate everything that's already been said, and I don't think there's honestly there's not much I can still contribute. But um, you know, what I hope I share will be uh, you know helpful for somebody on this call. Um, but uh, the first thing I wanted to mention though is um, I think. Uh, as a non-Black educator, growing up in the United States, we are already socialized to be white supremacists. Um, I think about the movie Lion King, right? It's a classic. Most of us have watched that when we were a kid. But, um, you know, if you think about that movie, there's a very, very stark distinction between Black and white and what's associated with Black and white. Um, and so as like a five, a four, a three, uh, however old you might be when you watch this movie, you already start associating whiteness as a good thing and blackness as a bad thing. Um, and, and I think when you grow up thinking like that and the rest of the world tells you these things throughout media and your family might grow up thinking like that, um, you have a lifetime of work to undo all of that. So even when like, you know, for example, 
I go to college and I study ethnic studies, right? I'm in ethnic studies and I graduate. And I'm thinking like, you know, I took ethnic studies. You know, I have like, you know, a, a new perception of what the world is, a historical context I didn't get when I was in, my, you know, in high school or in middle school. Uh, but when you enter the classroom, all that whiteness still lives inside you. Um, and when you're working with students, if you don't check that at the door and, and figure out how to, you know, how those um, anti, the, the anti-blackness that lives inside you will show up in ways that you're not with your students, that's when the hurt and the pain comes in. That's when the I won't learn from you comes in. And I think like the work that you do as a non-black educator before you even enter that classroom and every single day that you teach your students is incredibly important for you to be able to even reach your students. I, I, to me, one of the most powerful things I've heard is you know before you can reach your students' minds, you got to reach their heart, right? If you can't reach their heart, you're not going to be able to reach their minds. They're not going to learn from you. So what are you doing as an educator to get there? Um, and I think for me, uh, there's there's like a there's like three things I kind of focus on, right? And uh, the the reason why I wanted to start teaching about race was that I realized that this is it wasn't a part of our curriculum. This is my second year of teaching, and I was just like. Why are we not talking about race in our classrooms? Why aren't students learning about social justice in our classrooms? Why is our curriculum based off of a white his history, right? Like our, my students were rarely saw, my students rarely saw themselves in the curriculum that they were learning every single day and it wasn't relevant to their life. So I wanted to think about something and, and, and approach my teaching in a way that would empower my students uh, to love who they are and, and then utilize that as a, as a moment of power to uplift their voice and the changes they wanted to make in their community. Um, so uh, when I think about teaching, um, I kind of break it down into three buckets as far as where anti-blackness can show up or where you can validate blackness. You have the what you teach, which is really your curriculum, the why you teach, which is the purpose behind what you're teaching or its relevance to your students, and the, I have a newborn. I don't know if y'all heard that, but yeah. She might be allowed a little bit. <laughs> but also the, the, the last thing is the how you teach. Um, and all of that is, is based off of your relationships with your students, your communities, and your families. Um, and so uh, what you teach, if we recognize that our curriculum is already, um, it's based off of white standardized norms, that when we walk into the classroom, everything that we're going to be given is pretty much going to reflect a whiteness norm. So your job as a teacher is to audit your curriculum what is in your curriculum that is anti-black that you might not even realize because you've already gone through an education system that has validated your experience because you've been successful enough to become a teacher. Um, uh, that in itself, I think, is huge because your students, if they go to school every day and they don't see any of, like, any, if they don't see themselves in your teaching, then it's our, th th your, your curriculum is already telling them they're not validated in our world, right? You're not validating your students in our world based on the, the mere fact that there's nothing in your curriculum that looks like them or reflects their background or history or culture. Um, but that's, it doesn't end there, right? Because it, it's not only that you have, say, a curriculum that represents your students, it's also that is it relevant to your students' lives? And the number one question I challenge teachers to ask is every single thing you give your students, every single piece of paper, assignment, is it relevant enough to that when they leave your classroom that day, it applies to their life that day when they leave? They can immediately apply it that day. Because if, if they can't apply it that day, it's not relevant. Why should they care about, you know what I mean? You can have all the black people plastered on your wall. You can have all the social justice curriculum in your, in your, in your bookcase. But if it's not relevant to your students, it doesn't matter. They're not going to care about that, right? Like, and I think that's like the, the, uh, my... my um, my frustration right now is that there are a lot of people who want to take on, because it's easy, right? You, you can go to a lot of websites right now, and they just give you the curriculum. They give you the pictures of people to print out. They give you all, you can get all that, and boom, you can like, be like, look at me. Like, I'm anti-black. But your students will walk in that classroom and read all through that bullshit, because they know you haven't done the work of figuring out why this is even important. Um, and, and so I'll move from that to, I'll move from that to like the how. And I think the how sometimes is what's missing is uh, our approach to our practice, right? So even if you have uh, uh, a curriculum that represents your students, even if you have a really solid why, your, a, a good purpose and intention behind why you do everything that you do and it's relevant to your students, how you teach can still exclude black students in your classroom. I'm gonna give you a good example, and this is, this is one that I think most people can relate to. Uh, we've all in our education system been socialized to uh, ask and answer questions by raising our hands. So even, you know, even if you look at the Zoom chat right now, right, like the way that we talk is you raise your hand, or that's one way of signifying how you talk. Um, 
and, and when I moved to South LA, um, uh, one of the experiences I had was going to a praise dance for one of my students. Her name is Harmony. And when I went, this is my first time in a black church ever. And when I went to her church, um, the one thing I realized was that there was never a time when the congregation was praising that they had to raise their hand to praise Jesus. It was, uh, as the spirit moves you, you're going to praise Jesus. And I realized that, you know, if my, if my black students who go to church, come to school every single day, um, go have a, have a culture where raising your hand is never an expectation to express yourself, and yet you go to a school culture where raising your hand is the only thing you can do to express yourself, the times when they want to express themselves, usually when they're really excited to tell you an answer, is when they get excluded from the classroom. This is when, you, you know, this is when teachers go to their discipline policy. Sorry, you're, you're talking out of turn. Please raise your hand. But you're shutting down students who are excited to learn. And I think that's, those, are the, those are the smartest students in your classroom. Those are the ones that read through your bullshit. So, so you as a teacher have to recognize that if you come from a different, different cultural background than your students, there's a cultural mismatch from you as a teacher, the one who has the most authority in the classroom, and to your students. And if you, if, you, if you don't recognize that the way that you teach can still, like, you can, like so uh, the irony is the fact that you can have a teacher who has a social justice curriculum, curriculum is relevant with their students, but still is anti-black in the way that they teach. By way of not recognizing that their students at a deeper, deeper cultural level come from a different background from them, and therefore the, the process in which they learn is it the same as the process in which you learn? So I, I think like the, what, what we actually need to do with the how is like, you need to actually be developing protocols in your classroom that validate and affirm your students' home culture so that you can you know, have a protocol where if you're doing a call and response, you can say, shout it out, right? And if they shout it out, that's validating and affirming that culture of being able to call out an answer as opposed to raising their hand and waiting for someone to call on them. Um, and I, I, honestly, a lot of times, most students aren't going to raise their hand for like five minutes and wait for you to call them. They want to say something now. So, you know, recognize that as, a, as a, a, a really important part to this practice of being anti-Black and how you teach the practice. This is the one, one thing I want to bring up is like timing, right? A sense of timing. Culturally, uh, there's precise timing where everyone's just directly on time and relative timing, right? Where it's like, we go with the flow. If we go past the time, it's okay. We'll keep kind of like given the feelers with the community that you're building. Um, and a lot of my students had a relative timing culture where like if you, if you have a group of students talking, right, and you, you have a, a hard stop at five minutes, but they're, they're in a really good conversation, imagine cutting off that good conversation because you want to stick with your precise timing and bring it back to make sure that you complete your lesson by 1050, right? Like that, I think that's, that's the problem with what we're doing in our classes that even in a classroom where you're, you have social justice curriculum, even when you're relevant with your students, that you can still teach in a way that's anti-Black. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is all of that is, like everything that you do, right, the what, the how, the why, all that's summed up in relationships that you have with your students. You need to be walking with your students. You need to be asking feedback from them. You need to be learning from your families and your community about what's most important to them, and that drives everything else that you do in your classroom. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> and thank you so much Wang um, and I appreciate that you gave like some really tangible things to do for like folks to do tomorrow so thank you for being culture relevant for the audience and like thank y'all so much uh, there was so many gems and I think the biggest thing that I hear from all of you right is like if you're not actively changing what you're doing every single day and actively moving against the status quo, then you are already in reinforcing white supremacy, right? There is no, and I think uh, I was reading a study about like the burnout of people of color in social justice spaces. And a lot of the times it happens because of, of how we interact with white folks, um, right? Black folks, how we interact with uh, non-black folks. Like these, um, these cultural tensions, because we as adults have not worked them out, um, and oftentimes we put that labor on the black women of your schools, um, they, they just continue to reinforce. And one of the things that they were saying is, like, white folks sometimes take the easy way out in terms of, I am anti-racist, and like in the words of Savannah Shange, a couple of, so you want a cookie? Like, 
it's not a thing that you get to claim. It's not, it's, it's not Burger King, bro. When Burger King says 100% real meat, that tells me it's not real meat. When you say actively, I am anti-racist, that tells me you're not really anti-racist because that's a constant praxis. Unlearning these isms is, I'm not even unlearning, learning content on top of the isms is a constant practice, praxis. Um, so what we're gonna be moving to next, and I hope that folks, is the affinity groups, and I really invite you to be um, vulnerable as possible and, and really share openly about how you are socialized in anti-Blackness, how it shows up in your work. And then for, for uh, non-Black folks, like what can you do to address this? And then for black folks, we're gonna uplift like, what do you need from other folks? And so hope we can close out with some needs. And so it's really important. I've done this work for a while and I know from experience, it's really important that folks um, be honest um, with yourselves um, because it's from that space of honesty and vulnerability that we can begin to be held accountable. But when we're constantly, that also gaslights other people. And it's actually super validating for us. Um, when you're like, yeah, you're right, I've been racist. It's like, yes, okay, we can have another conversation now. So, um, and so if you can just really show up as honesty, uh, honestly as possible, I know it's uncomfortable. And then, um, and, and you'll, it'll be, there will be an element of safety because you will be in racialized affinity groups. And all of these things will be taken again to, into the facilitator's guide. Thank y'all so much. If we could give it up one more time for like our amazing, amazing practitioners who give me hope that uh, even though that, that, that are taking, I feel like taking the theory of academic spaces and really like moving that into the praxis, really being informed on the daily by these um, critical theories and, 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 and shifting the way we move through that. So thank y'all again, thank y'all so much. It's such an honor to be here with y'all. And then I'm not sure how these breakout rooms work. I'm not sure this one. <laughs> so just, um...